name is Bill Humber. It's my pleasure to be your MC. Um, we have a, um, a, a great cast of people that are going to work with you this afternoon. I'm going to quickly introduce them. Uh, Amy Boutenhouse. Did I say that correct, Amy? Uh, good. Um, Amy is, uh, has spent the last five years at the City of Toronto, most recently as the resilience lead in the City Manager's Office, leading to the creation of Toronto's first resilience strategy. Before that, she led major policy files related mostly to housing. Her most recent work includes regulating short-term rentals and creating new rent safe TO program. The first proactive inspection and landlord registration program for apartment buildings in Canada. She loves figuring out how cities can deal with new and wicked problems like climate change, access to safe and affordable housing, the sharing economy, and the changing nature of work. She holds an MA in Geography from the University of Toronto and a BSc in Applied Mathematics in Engineering and a BA in, in Geography from Queen's University. And she will be joined as a presenter today with Katrina O'Sullivan. Katrina has close to 15 years experience working in the emergency management field. She started her career with the Government of Ontario working on health system emergency management initiatives and she recently transitioned to working at the City of Toronto's Office of Emergency Management. Her operational response activations include infectious diseases, floods, forest fires, mass gathering events, I, I'm assuming that would be the Toronto Raptors celebrations, and drug shortages. Katrina also teaches courses in emergency management at Ryerson University. So before I turn it over to them, just a reminder that there is a sheet of paper that you're to fill out, and Andrew will be giving you more information on that um, as part of a submission that you will be making before you leave uh, today. Uh, the day will be broken into two parts. Uh, our speakers in the first half, then we'll take a short break, and then we're going to come back with an exercise for you um, put on by Dr. Jenny Hill on disaster management. So. A full day uh, is promised, and I think I've... Oh, Sally Moore is our uh, uh, note-taker scribe for the day. So if you have observations, comments, et cetera, that you would like in the final report, by all means, uh, make a B path to Sally at, at the break time. Great. So I believe, Amy, you're up first. And uh, take it away, please. Hi everyone, this looks like the sound is working and I can see my PowerPoint here, that's great. I'm really, really glad to be here with all of you. Um, so of course I work at the city as, as was introduced and um, I'm here with my colleague Katrina. What we'd like to do today with you is first I want to tell you a little bit about resilience, the way we think about it at the city um, and the resilience strategy that we developed over the last two years to guide our work at the city. And then uh, we want to tell you about two different projects that we're working on um, that's part of our bigger strategy. Um, and then we're happy to take any questions for, from, from all of you. And then um, I know after we're finished, you can get a chance to possibly develop your own resilience strategy. So it should be a really great afternoon. OK, there we go. Slide is moving. All right, so this whole conference is really about resilience, and I'm sure that you've all seen a lot of different definitions of this term. It's kind of a buzzword in some ways, and everybody has their own uh, way of taking this term and making it their own. For us, um, it's really important for us to think about the ability to survive, adapt, and thrive in the face of any challenge. So this is really about looking forward, looking into the future, and trying to understand what are the biggest challenges for us as a city that we're going to be facing, and how, as a municipal government, can we respond to those challenges. And so, of course, climate change is one of our biggest challenges and a big focus of our work. So 
we, the, at the City of Toronto, we started this program of thinking about resilience um, in a really formal way about two years ago um, as part of the 100 Resilient Cities global project and global movement. So there are around 100 other cities around the world, here we are, um, we all know where Toronto is, a um, hundred cities around the world have started to think about resilience in this coordinated and formal way. They've started to develop resilience, uh, uh, resilience strategies, and all of this work was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation um, to try to really bring cities together around this issue. And I think it's kind of, it's a really interesting approach because what we're saying is, um, you know, fe the federal governments around the world have a role to play in this work, so do the provincial and state level governments, but really cities are on the front line of climate change, whether uh, we're seeing hotter days in, in, our, in, our, um, in our ambulances and in our hospitals, um, whether we're seeing floods that um, you know, cover our roads and impact our power. We're really at the front lines of climate change, and so cities really need to actually work together um, to address this issue around the world. So we're really excited to be part of, these, part of this global movement with um, so many other cities around the world. So as I mentioned, we've, we've, we've spent the last two years kind of thinking about resilience and developing this strategy. We launched on June 4th, and we want to tell you a little bit about how we did that and some of the work that we're doing. This is a, pi a picture from our launch. So the first, the first step in our, in our work of creating this process was listening, and we had to really listen to um, our council and staff at the city, but most importantly to residents across the city and key stakeholders, key partners that we work with as a city, because we know that um, the city alone cannot respond to these um, big challenges, and we also know that residents really are understanding the impact of climate change in their daily lives, and they have a lot of really amazing ideas for what the city should do. We wanted our work to be fundamentally driven by the public and, and, and to be sure that the public is supportive um, and excited and engaged in this work. And Katrina's going to speak a little bit more about some of the ways we did that engagement work. Um, so from all of, so this slide, the details aren't important, but we, we tried to use a wide range of, of approaches to listening to the public. So um, we, we went into communities, we listened to stories, we had people um, create videos um, about their re resilience stories, we did mapping, um, we did online surveys, so a lot of different tools. And from that process, we really realized that we wanted to focus our work within the resilience world, which can be really broad, on two key issues, climate change and growing inequity. And I just want to talk a bit about both of those. Um, so I know that this room, I think, um, is probably not going to be surprised by some of this information. So I won't spend too much time on it. But we know that our communities are, are going to be really impacted by climate change. We're going to be seeing much, much hotter days. We're going to be seeing a lot more rain. And we're going to be seeing a lot more storms and unpredictable weather. Um, and so there are a lot of climate projections that, that um, uh, are, are being done by different levels of government, different research organizations, and for us it's really important to kind of take a few key points here and understand that our communities are going to be changing and that as a city we need to change our operations to respond. But it's not just our changing climate. Um, I wanted to just put a few images here um, to just kind of talk about how the public is also changing its understanding of climate change. So we're, we saw the big climate strike. I should have taken a photo of the climate strike and put it on here. Um, that happened a few weeks ago where around a million people across Canada came out. Um, you know, we have the TDSB um, students really engaged in this, in this process. And then even within our federal election, climate change has come up in a lot of different ways, whether we're talking about transit, whether we're talking about housing, Often it comes back to climate change. Is the housing that we have ready for a changing climate? Do the transit systems that we have really serve us well in the future with this diff these different weather patterns? Um, and so the, I think that really we're, we're in an interesting moment where the public is starting to have a different understanding of the urgency of climate change. Um, and recently our city council in Toronto declared a climate emergency. So we're starting to see um, both the public and politicians start to change their approach and understanding of climate change. So that's important. Then the second piece I wanted to talk about was growing inequality. So we know that our city is becoming more unequal and, um, and that this is happening geographically. So I have this map um, to kind of 
show this. So th this is individual average income. This is in 1996. You can see um, lower income neighborhoods are sort of in the pink and higher income neighborhoods are, are in the green. And you can see how much this has changed over, over the last 20-ish years. So I'll just do that again if I can get the slides here. So you can really see the way our neighborhoods are becoming more polarized in terms of income and that, that, that this is happening geographically in our city. And this is really, really important because when we're thinking about climate change, the thing that we know is that our most vulnerable communities are gonna be impacted most significantly. So if you live um, in a house in the beaches um, and it's a really, really hot day, um, you, can, you might have air conditioning, you might be able to go for a walk by the water, um, uh, and, and you might um, be able to connect with your neighbors, maybe have a barbecue. If you're living in an apartment tower on the, the 12th floor of an apartment building, it's going to be really, really hot in that apartment building. We know that 94% of our apartment buildings in Toronto don't have air conditioning, so you're not going to have air conditioning. And if the power goes out in your building, you won't even be able to get down the stairs if, you're, if you have mobility issues, if you have kids, if you're older. So depending on your income, depending on your neighborhood, depending on where you live, the impact of climate change is going to be vastly, vastly different. And so in any response that we are thinking about, um, in, in terms of responding to climate change, we have to think about growing an inequality um, and the way that that plays out in our city. And if we don't, we're not going to be successful in actually responding to climate change. And all of this is happening in the context of growth. So as a city, we are growing really quickly. Um, we're one of the fastest growing cities in the world. We have the, 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 some of the most development happening in the world. I think we are, we are the city with about the second most cranes in the world. Um, so we're really changing really, really quickly. And so there's so much opportunity for us with this change and all the different investments we're, we're making to respond to this growth um, to really make sure that all those investments are, are helping us be more resilient. So I'm just going to check my time here. Great. Um, so I talked about our big focuses being climate change and inequality. So that's kind of what we're focusing on. But how, what, how do we do that work? And how, how do we build that strategy? One of the things that we did um, to figure that out is to look at our past. And so I just want to tell a quick story that kind of helps guide our thinking uh, today. And so um, I just want to talk briefly about Hurricane Hazel. Has anybody heard about Hurricane Hazel or learned about it before? Seeing some folks on this side of the room. Yeah, a few, a few people. So Hurricane Hazel was a, a hurricane that happened in, in 1954. Um, and it's, it was in the Atlantic Ocean. So it started in Haiti. And it had some really significant impacts in Haiti. Around 500 people were killed. And so much damage happened. And then it kind of moved up the coast and ended up in Toronto, um, where Many more than 54 um, died. This is one of the earlier reports, I believe. Around 80, I believe, people died in Toronto, and there was an incredible amount of damage that happened to our city. It was one of the costliest and most damaging hurricanes that had ever happened um, in our city. And I have these kind of these bubbles here um, to just show that after this hurricane happened and all this significant damage happened, our city came together and said, we need to respond. We need to do things differently than we have before because this can never happen again. And so you can kind of see, you know, the conservation authorities um, were created in the, in the 40s and they started to put together some response to flooding, um, but they were rejected. Um, and a few years later when Hurricane Hazel happened, all of, those, the, all of that work started to seem like probably a good idea. And so um, the city took some really, really serious steps to protect itself from flooding. So stuff like expropriating lands, changing the way that we plan our city, um, really different ways of planning in order to make sure we would never again face the kind of damage that, that we faced from Hurricane, from Hurricane Hazel. Um, and so when I think about that lesson, for me, what that, what that really tells us um, is we have to change the way we're doing business. We, 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 um, we can't continue to kind of make a small little change here and a small little change here. Those things are important. But we also need to, to kind of look and say, what do we fundamentally need to change about the way that we're, that we're working? How can we do things differently? And at that time, it looked like 
um, expropriating land and changing plan planning approval. So what does that look like now? How can we really change the way we're doing things um, right now? So I want to give um, two examples of the work that we're doing where we're trying to, to take that approach, trying to change the way we've always done things. Um, and the first is around flooding, and the second is around emergency preparedness and neighborhood resilience, which Katrina is going to speak to. And I'm going to just catch up in my notes here. So where are we today with flooding? Well, we still, we still face fl flooding from our rivers, for sure, riverine flooding. We are also facing urban flooding, just fl flooding from storms. And then we're also seeing really high levels of Lake Ontario. So Lake Ontario, um, has, in the last few years, has been the highest that it's ever been in its history. And that has caused some pretty significant damage on the island um, in terms of the houses there, also some critical infrastructure on the island, excuse me, and also along our waterfront as well. Um, Excuse me. So we're facing all of these, these flooding challenges in our city from the rivers, from the sky, from Lake Ontario. And one of the, the challenges um, of, our, of, of working in this space is that there isn't one clear person or organization that's responsible for responding to all of this work. Actually, there are so many different key partners across the city that have a stake in flooding, but not one clear organization who's really uh, responsible or accountable for this work. Um, and, and we tend to work within our silos. So at the city, um, there's one department that deals with our sewer system um, and, and our water utility. There's another department that just deals with our roads. And then we have Metrolinx, who's dealing with the GO train and the TTC dealing with the subway and hydro. We have TRCA dealing with um, riverine flooding. And so all of these different groups, they wear a different hat. Um, and that's very important for them to be kind of experts within their own world, but they also, we also need to work together um, to make sure we're all addressing flooding together. So one of the things that we tried to do is bring this group together. Um, doesn't actually sound the most innovative, but actually it's, it's pretty hard to work across silos within government, and so that's what we tried to do. We brought this group together, um, and we tried to um, develop a plan for how we're going to respond um, to, to flooding issues in our city. Um, and so we kind of took this question as our guiding principle. How can the city and our partners better understand and take appropriate action to address flood risk? And the first step in that process was we developed this charter. And the details aren't important really here, but um, the idea is that all of these different stakeholders came together um, to say we want to prioritize um, flooding, and we want to do it in a way that looks at risk. So where are we most at risk, and how do we work together to plan? So one example is if we know that one part of our city is at risk, instead of each individual department or organization or agency responding, um, we want to work together. So if we know this neighborhood's at risk, we can look and say, OK, um, is there a TTC stop in this neighborhood? Is there a hospital in this neighborhood? Is there one bridge that if it went down, no one would be able to access the emergency room? So that kind of integrated planning is something that we really want to do. Um, and this charter kind of sets us up to do, to do that. And I think I don't have an image of it, but um, um, uh, the, when we released this charter, we actually made the front page of the Toronto Star, which is kind of funny because if you work in government, you're not used to having one of your working groups make the front page of the Toronto Star. But I think it kind of speaks to um, this idea that the public is really, really interested in governments working together in a different way um, and working to... Um, uh, working to uh, really address these problems in, 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 a, in a more serious way than we have before. So that's all I'll say about flooding, and then I want to turn it over to my colleague Katrina to tell you a bit about our approach to emergency uh, response and making our neighborhoods more resilient. Okay. Uh, so, as was introduced, my, my name is Katrina O'Sullivan, and my background is in the field of emergency management. Um, and so, I've only recently actually joined the City of Toronto. I've been there for about a year. And one of the initiatives I started working on right away was uh, supporting the Resilience Office and its efforts to build neighborhood resilience. Neighborhood resilience is about making sure that our communities, our neighborhoods at the local level have the ability to adapt, thrive, and change in the face of challenges. 
in my in my field, you know, I've developed a lot of emergency plans over the years, and these plans, it's really important that you're not building a plan in a silo. Organizations have to work uh, vertically with other organizations. We also have to be able to work with different levels of uh, government, so the federal, the provincial, the local government, and I see this as being really similar to the kind of work that we need to start doing with neighborhoods. We've, over the years in the emergency management field, been encouraging individuals to have their own emergency plan, for families to have an emergency kit, um, a 72-hour kit. I want to just take a survey here. How many of you have a 72-hour kit in your house so that you would be able to take care of yourself and your family for 72 hours? So I see a few hands, so that's good. The message is getting out, but I mean, there's still a lot of work to do, obviously. Um, and this really has been one of the ways in emergency management, one of the emphasis that we've had for kind of working with communities. But I think we're starting to realize that, um, you know, families, individuals, they're not going to survive an emergency and adapt all by themselves. It's really going to be about the connections they have with their neighbors. If they're living in a vertical high rise type building, about knowing people within the building that they can turn to. Um, but even in, in houses and other kind of living situations that they have people they can turn to. Um, and especially, you know, if you don't have your own emergency kit, where are you going to get food and water? Chances are, collectively in your neighborhood, there'll be those kind of resources that you can access. Um, and this is a new way of working at the City of Toronto, kind of uh, with Amy's theme of finding new ways to tackle some of these challenging problems. But it's a new way for us to work in the field of emergency management, is thinking about connections of people. And that's what this initiative is going to be um, exploring. Um, and I really like this quote uh, I'm going to read out. It's from Wellington, New Zealand, um, and the work they've done on neighborhood resilience. But at the heart of a resilient community is a robust set of social networks that help people to address the challenges in their day-to-day -day lives, as well as those of, that occur in extreme stress. So a resilient neighborhood can come together. There'll be social networks, and they can use these networks to help with kind of daily stresses that they may experience, as well as those big shocks. Um, and one thing we've done with the Resilience Office and over this last year is we're really trying to learn from the work that other jurisdictions have done. Um, some cities experience big shocks more often than Toronto does. It's happening, it's coming here, and I think more than ever we need to be doing this work with the threat of climate change on the horizon. But some communities, um, like in New Zealand, where they had the big Christchurch earthquake in 2013, there's a lot we can learn about what they've done to kind of regroup and rebuild after that. Um, we're also turning to um, cities that have had more severe flooding events, like Calgary. Um, so we are definitely turning and looking to best practices from other jurisdictions. And we see more and more emergency management is turning to the fact that we need to be building up neighborhoods to be able to respond. Um, so in the resilience strategy, we do have a specific action related to neighborhood resilience. Um, action A 2.1, enhancing the capacity of neighborhoods to prepare for and recover from shocks through grassroots action and network building. So it's about helping groups of people to, to make sure they're ready for emergencies. This action came out of a lot of work that's happened over the last few years. Um, and a big part of this was the resilient conversations that the Resilience Office led. So through this work, the Resilience Office was able to speak to over 200 Torontonians um, kind of in a real personal, intimate way to learn more about what people that are living in some of the most vulnerable areas of the city, including vulnerable to the effects of climate change, but also other vulnerabilities like poverty, um, access to jobs, access to other opportunities, what their thoughts about are how to build a more resilient city. And then that's how this action came out of their feedback. Um, to do this work, the city's resilience office partnered with a network called the Local Champions Network. So there's 54 local champions across the city of Toronto. These are residents, community members, that have an interest in doing community building in their neighborhood. And they've gone through an entire training program about how to be engaged, how to be 
involved in civic discussions and civic discourse, how to mobilize, how to engage. They've gone through a, a bit of a, a boot camp um, through uh, an organization in Scarborough called the Center for Connected Communities. And we were able to tap into this network of local champions to have these conversations because the conversations, you know, sometimes when you want to go into neighborhoods where people are more vulnerable, there may be more distrust of government, and it's better to have conversations that they're considering kind of from someone in their community, so peer-to-peer, -peer, rather than having government in the room, and that's what we were able to do through this process. So through the local champions network, we were able to build, co-develop a toolkit with them about how to have these conversations, and then they went out and had these conversations in neighborhoods across Toronto and share that information and data back with the resilience office to help build the strategy. Um, here are some of the resilient conversations in progress. So Thorncliffe Park, Agincourt, and Lawrence Heights were some of the neighborhoods where these conversations with local champions were had. Um, and some of the outcomes from these conversations. So first, there were very diverse perspectives on the resilience cha challenges faced neighborhood by neighborhood. I mean, I think we intuitively understand that, but it was good to have that validated from this information gathering and listening exercise. So not every neighborhood's gonna be concerned about the same shock and stress. Um, in the field of emergency management, there's all hazards planning versus risk specific planning. Um, so, you know, you can develop a plan that will help you address any type of hazard, or you can do more specific plan planning for a specific hazard like a pandemic or a flood. And I think these conversations showed us that we need to be very risk specific in these neighborhoods, it has to be very personalized to what they think the shocks and stresses are that they're experiencing. Um, we also learned that there's a broad understanding already about a lot of assets, resources, and relationship that exist in each neighborhood. And if we're gonna do this work, we really need to understand the strengths and the advantages that each neighborhood can bring and almost have like an inventory of that that the neighborhood can turn to during a shock. Um, so there's a lot of good, there's a lot of, a lot of good, a lot of positive um, advantages to each neighborhood that can be drawn on, those strengths. Um, the, this resilient conversations work also really helped us um, have an integrated and intersectional understanding of resilience building. So different, uh, different groups in a community are gonna see resilience differently and we're gonna have to take different steps. So uh, what needs to be done to support a senior might be different than what needs to be support um, young children in a neighborhood. Uh, new Canadians coming to a community might have different things they can offer to um, the experience of building their neighborhood preparedness, and all of this has to be considered, and those resilient conversations really helped make that clear. Um, these conversations really, too, helped to generate buy-in for the city's first resilience strategy and early adopters. So through these conversations, we now have, through the local champions network and the people they talked, people that we can go back to now to do this work with. So uh, all of this now takes us to what we're doing with that action item in the resilience strategy. And we have come up with a pilot project that we're about to launch, hopefully any week now. Um, but we're gonna spend the first couple months of this pilot developing what's known as a theory of change model. So we're gonna be gathering as Amy said, there's you know a lot of silos in government as well as between our different partners. So we're gonna try to bring everyone together, first responders, so representatives from police, fire, paramedics, um, TRCA, um, the Canadian Red Cross, other areas of the city of Toronto, get everyone in a room together to really figure out what is the end goal of our work with these communities and a theory of change once you have your end goal you kind of walk walk backwards through the steps that you need to take to get there and all the assumptions that you're building into your project and we're also going to identify our pilot sites so this is really going to be um, an interesting experience we're trying to come up with our selection criteria now um, and we're really hoping to work in neighborhoods where there's a lot of momentum um, so we have a lot of selection choices to make because there's a lot of areas across the city that are doing really, really good work. Um, and we're hoping to focus on neighborhoods 
that have been identified as neighborhood improvement areas. Um, it's kind of an identification process that happens through the City of Toronto. Um, and I think it's kind of in partnership with the United Way, but identifying neighborhoods where uh, resources um, might be warranted to help kind of deal with some inequity challenges in those neighborhoods. After that, the next step is going to be doing mapping. So it's going to be identifying all those assets and strengths that exist in the community, as well as maybe the specific challenges and risks that those neighborhoods have. And then finally, we're going to take all that information to develop some neighborhood action plans. Um, and something that we really want to pilot with this process is explore um, what a neighborhood resilience hub could look like. And this is basically, we're hoping, going to be a space in the community during an emergency where people can go and neighbors can help neighbors. Um, so as I said, traditionally in the field of emergency management, <coughs> we encourage personal preparedness. We would also encourage like a business to have a business continuity plan or a not-for-profit or you know, a faith-based group to have some type of emergency plan to know how to take care of themselves and their members. Um, but a resilience hub will actually be a space in a community where in an emergency, neighbors can go and it'll be a place where neighbors can help neighbors. So, you know, maybe if everyone in a neighborhood doesn't have an emergency kit and there's some people that are having a hard time accessing food or water, this will be a place where people can actually go and exchange those kind of resources. Or, you know, in an ice storm scenario, this will be a place where people can go and figure out where they have to where they can get shovels locally and what houses they need to go to to help shovel because maybe there's seniors living in those homes or people with disabilities that can't get out. Really basic kind of tasks that people will be able to identify locally. And the challenge will be to figure out how did these kind of hubs then integrate with the city's more formal response. So we know um, in an emergency, first responders, um, other you know, fire, police, paramedics, hospitals, um, road crews are going to be focused on really those high priority critical areas. And they'll need to focus on those. But this kind of model will allow other people that living in the community to try to take care of themselves and their neighbors until first responders can come to them and see how they're doing. Um, and this, we think, will be very complementary to basically city plans because it'll allow the city to remain focused on the most critical infrastructure and critical issues and to have people be able to tap in and help each other out. And we know this kind of work's already happening, obviously, during the 2000 ice storm, during the flooding events that we've had over the last couple of years. Neighbors do help neighbors out, but we want to kind of formalize this a bit more and bring it into the city's overarching emergency management framework. Um, and this pilot project is going to be a way for us to explore this a bit. And I think that brings me to the end of the presentation. So we're excited to start this pilot project um, and all the other resilience activities. But maybe now I think we can open up to questions. <laughs> Amy, do you want to join us up on the stage, please? So you folks are uh, going to be involved in some manner or other on the design or in the active uh, activity of perhaps emergency planning, emergency response. Um, what are some questions you might have of these new directions that we might be seeing emerging in fields that perhaps 25 years ago were not priorities, that, but that have now become priorities? As climate change often is seen as something, uh, had been seen as something that uh, on one side there was a long time period of denial. That's pretty well gone by. On the other hand, there can be a long time period of despair. We're kind of in the middle. We're kind of in the doing phase here, getting things to happen, getting things um, to be better prepared in the event of, of emergencies and the, the, in the event of unpredictable catastrophes. So take it away. Who's, who's got some thought provoking questions for? Our audience. Yes, Tim. Uh, and he has a big voice, so he doesn't need the... Um, oh, They're okay. used to me. It's okay. <laughs> Go ahead, so Tim. what were the three things that we learned from the ice storm that occurred here in the city of Toronto that we can apply as a resilient strategy? In my own personal case, I rely on partners that have a sense of the ice. Even though I've been involved in scouting, we had to skirt around the house because it wasn't organized. Of the ice storm that occurred here in the city of Toronto and the city council in the city 
Trina, Amy, who wants to take that one? Yeah, I, if we can probably tag team it. Yeah, sounds Please. good. Um, uh, so one thing, I mean, I wasn't at the city of Toronto when that happened. I was actually at the provincial government. But one thing I've heard, um, like the city of Toronto did open up reception centers. Um, people did come to like charge their phones and, you know, grab a cup of coffee. But people didn't really spend the night at these reception centers. So even though power was out, um, people in general prefer to be home or prefer to find a friend or family's house to go to. And I think we should be building those kind of preferences and tendencies into some of our planning. So when we're exploring this resilience hub, um, you know, most likely the city, city infrastructure will still provide like the overnight sheltering for people that want it. And we're gonna free up these resilience hubs to really focus on neighbors helping neighbors, not really, you know, providing a place to sleep necessarily, um, but more to problem solve the other issues. Because we know as much as possible, and I mean, I feel this way, I want to stay in my own house in an emergency. So if I can stay in my neighborhood, but know there's a place to go to where if I don't have food or I need a few extra blankets, my neighbors will be there to help me, um, I think that's something worth exploring. And then we can leave the city's more formal response of providing overnight shelter for people whose houses just aren't suitable to spend the night or you know, maybe the power outages have been going on for a long time and it's getting really, really cold. Um, but, I, you know, I thought that was interesting to hear when I joined the city at, like, you know, you'd think the ice storm, there would have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people that needed places to spend the night, and that wasn't the case at all. They just kind of needed a place to go to do a few tasks, get a cup of coffee, find out what's happening, and then they wanted to kind of take care of themselves as much as they could. So that was one thing I learned. I'll add that, I mean, there are some really practical things, like um, we need to make sure that when we're designing community centers, we design them with uh, the idea in mind that they might at some point be used um, in an emergency as a, as a place where, where people can go. And so what, what do we need to put into a community center? There are some basic things like rooms that, that are big enough for a lot of people to go to and possibly backup generators, that, that kind of stuff. But I think one of the big takeaway messages that at least I've, I've her, heard in hearing people speak about that emergency um, is coordination. So um, there, when that emergency happens, there is an outpouring of, of energy from residents around the city. They want to help. They want to be involved. City councillors want to be involved and help. And um, the city really struggles to communicate with all of those different people and coordinate that work and make sure that everybody is taken care of and everybody um, is supported. Um, and so at the same time that there's this outpouring of energy, um, there's also sometimes a, a lack of information about what, what needs to be done so we don't know where our most vulnerable residents are. And so there's all this energy and support and, and people want to help and yet they don't know that their next door neighbor might actually um, not be able to leave their house because of some mobility issue and they're really um, at risk of going hungry because they don't have enough food. So that's a, a, a really important lesson that came from that work. We're still trying to figure out how to really implement that on the ground and that's part of our work um, with, with this neighborhood resilience pi pilot is when communities are connected and when they know each other and, and um, understand what's going on in the community, they're better, so they're better able to respond in an emergency. Yes. Hold on, uh, Andrew's gonna bring you the, the mic. There you go. Let's get real close. Oh, this is awkward. Okay. <laughs> this is gonna be an oddball question, but since this is in Toronto, and I know there's homeless people in Toronto who don't have readily access this sort of information, what steps are being made to help them? Because if they're sleeping on the street and there's a flood, there's a high chance they can drown in their sleep or that they can't evacuate properly because all of their clothes are their utensils and stuff have now gotten soaked and wet, right? So, yeah. it's not that oddball. It's no, a very good that's question. That's a great question. Yeah. I was just at a meeting today, actually, where we were talking about um, like the risk of flash flooding in some of the riverines. So, river flooding. I mean, flash flooding can happen in different ways. But, I mean, someone posed that question. Like, we could. So, Ontario now has alert ready. Have you been receiving the Amber Alerts over the last six months are a little bit controversial, I understand. Some calls to 911 after that happened, but I mean, that alert ready system is the same system that we, the city, could use if there was an urgent time sensitive life safety issue. So for example, if there was gonna be a flash flood that was imminent, um, I'm not sure if any of you lived in Toronto, like in July, 2013, 
there was a flash flood kind of on July 8th, or yeah, I think it was the 8th, where a GO train got stuck in the Don Valley. Um, so maybe like alert ready could have been used in that scenario to notify people immediately to evacuate an area. Like don't, do not proceed any further. If you're on foot, get out on foot. Um, but we were just asking that question. So how would people that are underhoused or homeless get that message? And we need to figure some of these things out. So they're definitely on our radar. Um, but there's, this is I think where um, really understanding the diverse experience of people in our community is important. Um, and it's not going to be a one size fits all solution, but maybe megaphones have to be used or there's other ways to communicate with people that don't have cell phones in those kind of urgent situations. So that's one example that came up, but I'm sure Amy has other. Just before you get there, Amy, there was a sign I noticed uh, in a, a hotel about a year and a half ago. And it said, in the event of fire, do not use the elevator. And I, as I saw that sign, I was reminded of something that happened a couple of months before where two guys almost drowned in their elevator in their apartment building when they went down to the basement to get their car. The doors wouldn't open and it started filling up with water. So it's almost like our signage and our preparedness has to be taking new things into account. The sign almost should read, in the event of fire or flooding, or do heavy not, rain, or yeah, heavy, heavy rain, rain or, yeah. or whatever, do not yeah. take. That the, was August 2018. Yes. Yep. 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 Amy, did you have some thoughts on that one? Yeah, I wanted to, to add, I'll, I'll answer in kind of two ways. One is um, there are very, like to Katrina's point about thinking about what hazards are we facing, we have a particular response for heat. So um, if there's a, a really hot summer going on, um, we have a program where our staff will go around to folks that are street involved or living on the street or under housed and tell them about um, the fact that it's really hot out, provide them with water, provide them with some ideas about where they could go to cool off. So that's kind of, that's like the Band-Aid solution for what we would do if, if it was really hot out. And this is an ongoing program that we do each summer. And actually, the, the, the people who are actually going around to speak to homeless folks on the street, those people ha were formerly homeless themselves or involved um, in, in their underhoused either in the past or currently. So we try to involve the residents um, in that program as well. But I think I wanna um, kind of always take us bigger picture. Like the solution to that problem is housing people, right? And so for, for the, the, the resilience strategy, we always wanna be thinking about that bigger picture. So ultimately, like s someone involved in our process shared that if we eradicated poverty, we would be prepared for climate change more than any dollar of investment that we could do into our infrastructure, into our flooding infrastructure, our, our transit, anything. So if, if, we're, if we're addressing the root problems of, of um, people being underhoused by giving them homes, they are, they're not gonna be on the street and they're not gonna be so vulnerable. And so we always have to be thinking about the, those two pieces and, and there's kind of an attention there of how you do that work, but it's, it's really, really important. We can't forget about that bigger picture. We need to house people. And, that, and so housing people is a climate change response. And, and like, so that's, that's, that's the, the message that I'm trying to, to bring at the city um, and that I wanna share here, right? Like housing people is, is responding to climate change. Building transit is responding to climate change. Was there a follow-up to that? I know you, you had, you put your pet, good. Oh. I had another question. Well, if you're gonna be making changes to how the build, uh, not the building, the city's gonna be designed to help this, what can people do to their housing right now to help this? Like, I know some houses in different countries have a little moat around with the drainage system so that if a flood does happen, it drains into the drainage and then comes on the other side or goes straight into the sewer. But I know that might be expensive and time consuming because you have a bunch of people trying to modify their house all at once to survive flooding. So what would be like a very cost effective and time efficient way of modifying their houses to prevent floods or help reduce the damage from floods? Great question. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember all the different remedies, but we, we've built a little a website about this uh, um, exact question, um, which is going to be launched in November, so we're excited about that. But some of the really low-cost things you can do are clean your eaves troughs. If you live in a house, um, clean your eaves troughs um, and look at, look at your foundation and make sure excuse me, that you don't have like a giant window um, and then just your garden abutting right, 
up against your window because water could get in that way. So some really basic stuff. And then there are some other additional measures you could take um, in terms of your basement. You could uh, make sure that there's proper drainage in your basement. You could look into a sump pump that might be a bit more costly, but still you could, you could um, uh, make that kind of um, investment for like under $1,000. And then there's also um, looking just at your, at your yard in general. So how much of your yard is covered in permeable, um, in permeable surfaces? So if you have concrete all over your front yard and all over your backyard, um, that's going to be kind of a risk in terms of a flood because there's nowhere for the water to go when it comes down. So looking at making sure that you have grass on your yard or, or a, a garden um, and making sure that um, your eaves troughs can collect water and move the water to a place where it could actually be collected. Those are some, some things. There's probably people in this room who actually know more about this than me, but yeah. We got another question right here. Uh, <sighs> do I have to use the microphone? <laughs> Shy? Um, are you working with the city to um, make some of these changes for flooding prevention mandatory, or is it all recommended and then it's kind of up to the homeowner? There are some mandatory uh, programs and some voluntary programs. So there are some mandatory programs around the way that people, they're around downspouts and, and their um, eat troughs and where water goes from your downspout. Um, but a lot of this stuff is voluntary. And, um, you know, even, I mean, one of the things we've learned from our downspout disconnection program is that when you make something voluntary, or when you make something mandatory, that doesn't actually necessarily result in change. It's actually really hard to get millions of people to change their behavior, even if you make it mandatory, right? Like if, if it says on our website that it's mandatory, if it says in the law that something's mandatory, how do we actually make sure that people take action? Um, and so um, we have, that's one of the, the problems that we're looking at right now. So how do we engage people on social media? How do we have a website that's really clear for residents to understand? Um, and how do we connect to people where they're at? So if somebody's coming in for a building permit, maybe they can have more information about some of these programs that are voluntary but that could really help them. Um, and then another piece is, is working with insurance companies. So insurance companies can start to say, we're going to have a reduced rate for your insurance if you take these measures. And some insurance companies are starting to do that. It's interesting, I mean, you, you look at an area like fire alarms, where once it was just, um, well, uh, maybe we'll do it. Then there was a good public education campaign, and now we've got to the point where they're mandatory. So, you know, these things do move through a kind of a progression over time. Um, sometimes it isn't possible to implement them immediately, but over time they do become part of the kind of expected legal obligation that one finds. Did you have anything to add to that, Katrina, the, in terms of how you can prepare your household, uh, where you're living for yeah, the unexpected I, calamity? I guess insurance, that which Amy touched upon, but and for individuals that are renting, having renter's insurance, yeah, because it's hard, you can't necessarily make changes to the infrastructure if you're renting, but um, if you can afford renter's insurance, and something does happen, it gives you a lot more options. I mean, I'm not gonna guarantee that every form of renter's insurance covers the same thing. You'd have to like figure that out. But for example, if the unit that you were living in was flooded, um, like your landlord depends if they are a good actor or a bad actor, how they'll like behave in that scenario. But if you have your own form of insurance that would provide you with like hotel accommodation until you can get back up on your feet and find a new place or cover your losses, that would be really great to have. And um, so if, I don't know if any of you are renting, that might be something you wanna think about looking into. Um, it can be another, it's a good thing to have access to. Great, Tim over here has another question. So, and what is the, uh, is it still on a, a grant or something that we can use our paper there? So that's to do with, for those, that, those who didn't hear, the Black Back Flow Preventer Program. Maybe you could describe quickly what that means and yeah, what the Yeah, Amy probably knows are. a bit more about it, but I understand it helps with sewage backup. It's a... Uh, Yes, the mm -hmm. short answer is yes. So we do, we do have that program in place. There are grants available. And I actually don't know that much about the program. So um, 
I can't say too much more about it, but maybe you can or someone else in the room if they know. I but welcome I, your... I guess that's another way, like if you can't make things mandatory, at least we can start to incentivize people. And that's a good example. And I think there's probably been pretty good uptake of that program as we have more and more of these events. Good. Any Anything else? Anybody else have a comment? Yes. Jenny. Never heard a disaster referred to as popular, but I'm sure everybody would like to have one in their lifetime. Um, I'll give Amy and Katrina a chance. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, they weren't all uh, uh, weather related, right? So a lot of neighborhoods are dealing with community violence and shootings. So that's something that came up in our in our work a lot. Um, and then heat also came up um, quite a lot. Then there are some other, uh, like something that we heard a lot because we were in some, some tower neighborhoods was stuff around building maintenance, so elevators, so people getting stuck in elevators. Um, I'm not sure if anyone lives in an apartment building, but this is one of the biggest issues that apartment building residents face um, in, in Toronto, and maybe some of you experienced this issue as well. So I think from a city perspective, we wouldn't say that an, that an elevator breaking down is the kind of emergency that we are thinking about in terms of these bigger these bigger shocks. But when you think about in your neighborhood, and, and this happens, I live in an apartment building too, so on the weekend, there was a resident in my, in my building who got stuck in the basement uh, in, in an elevator, um, and they had their three-year-old with them, and our, our security system didn't work. So when we pressed the button, no one responded, and they were in there for about an hour and a half. And people didn't know they were down there. So now, every time I leave my house, I'm just kind of like, do I want to take the elevator? Maybe I'll take the stairs. And I, I feel stressed. And so when you think about the impact of that across our communities, if, if there are so many residents in apartment buildings across Toronto, and they're constantly being stuck in their elevators, or they're stressed out about the elevator, then in an emergency, they're going to be really concerned. Like, how will I get my mother down the stairs um, if, she can't, if she can't move? And um, so... These, this is kind of the, the interesting thing that, that we hear when we go out to community is that we don't always hear the, the typical concerns um, that at the city we would think of, and that's why we really need to hear from residents what are their concerns. If we can fix that, that elevator or fix the issue around elevators and apartments, that'll go a long way in helping people feel like their homes are resilient to any kind of challenge that they might face. But yeah, I mean, flooding, heat, um, power outages... Um, and then community violence is something that we heard about quite a bit. Okay, uh, we're going to do one more um, gentleman here. Have you ever considered using reservists in emergency response? Uh, you're talking about military reservists, or yeah. Yeah. yes, yeah, not me personally, but I could ask our. I'll hand that to Katrina. Yeah, so um, there are kind of processes and protocols for bringing in the military to support with responses. Um, like a big snowstorm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, everyone, I don't know, I'm not even sure if you were all born, but Mel Lastman wanted to bring in the military to help with a snowstorm in 1999, um, which, you know, people still laugh about because <laughs> I guess it didn't feel like it was bad enough to warrant bringing the military in, but the military does come in. I would say, like, in a city that's as well-resourced as the city of Toronto, and I think this might be why people are questioning why Mel Lastman did this, most emergencies, we have a lot of resources that we can call upon. Um, so you actually may see the military supporting more kind of smaller jurisdictions. Like, I understand the flooding that happened in Bracebridge, Ontario this year was pretty significant and severe. And a smaller community might get overwhelmed quicker in those type of events. And we're not, you know, some municipalities, they have volunteer firefighters. So they don't have, like, the resources we have. So military usually helps out in those scenarios more. Same with the um, evacuations that happen in First Nation communities up north. Um, but at the city of Toronto, for sure they're a resource. But luckily we're so well resourced. And we had a lot, like, a lot of MOUs with neighboring municipalities that it's not something that you would see as quickly happen, but it's definitely something that's there that we can turn to. Well, thank you very much, uh, Katrina and Amy. Um, there, you're going to stick around for a few minutes. Uh, if people have yeah. questions afterwards, great. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a bit of a break, 15, 20 minutes. 
Uh, we coffee, juices, etc., have arrived. So um, make uh, take uh, use of those. I want to um, ask our green citizen volunteers from our project management and the environment program to all stand up. They're the ones wearing those snazzy T-shirts, and just thank them for all the work that they're putting in over these three days. Nice work, guys. And I'm going to, I'm going to invite our gift master, Andrew Wickham, uh, to come to the stage. Um, and he's probably got a few things to say about s these packages that he's going to give to our two guests. Andrew, take it away. All right, well, thank you very much for both, uh, both of you. Uh, that was really, really great engaging uh, discussion and presentation. So just a couple of more snack food in there, some Seneca honey, which is like locally here, some other nice like chocolates and uh, snacks there, but also, um, if you can see in the back here, uh, we have actually donated a lot of money to make this entire event carbon neutral. So we have 24 tons of CO2 offsets for supporting different, uh, or, uh, different things all over the world from solar panel projects, clean water, solar cooking. So anyways, we just want to thank you again very much for all that you've done here. And uh, yeah, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, one last thing. I don't know if it was said before, but everything here, uh, except for the pop cans, are biodegradable. So everything goes in the compost. So nothing goes in the garbage unless you brought it yourself. Um, but everything goes in the compost. Pop cans obviously go in recycling. So you're only using two things now. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs>